Just like the meteor bursting onto the scene, AMD, those maniacs, those wonderful, lovable maniacs, broke into the scene with their 64-bit extensions. And that's the 64-bit extensions that we use today, even though Intel had their own. They really disrupted things. Yes, actually, 20 years ago, nearly to the day, AMD introduced the Opteron, the world's first x86 64-bit processor, or an x86 processor with 64-bit extensions. That's the basis of modern 64-bit computing in both Intel and AMD desktop CPUs. It's kind of a big deal. It's ubiquitous now in 2023. And it was a bit strange for AMD to introduce the 64-bit standard to the world that, you know, the standard that we've all come to use. I mean, Intel had been the ones to introduce the world to 32-bit computing. They designed and implemented 32-bit extensions to x86 in the Intel 386 or i386 in 1985. I mean, Intel was making the i386 until 2007? 2007? That can't be right, and it is, because the i386 was so important to computing history, the 386 brought all kinds of new features and support for systems and everything like that with up to four gigabytes of memory at a time when systems barely had a couple of megabytes of memory. Four gigabytes when, you know, two, three, eight megabytes of memory? Yeah. Well, fast forward to 2023, AMD 64-bit extensions have now been out longer than the i386 32-bit extensions had been when AMD launched AMD 64. 20 years now. That's pretty good. Now, I'm sorry. I just made a lot of people feel very old. Sorry about that. Because... Some of you were there, but this is kind of a tribute and an homage to 64-bit computing. I mean, AMD 64-bit extensions, dubbed AMD 64, have become just as important as 32-bit was 20 years ago. Now, in addition to adding support for addressing up to 256 terabytes of memory with the 64-bit extensions, it also doubled the number of general purpose CPU registers, made the registers 64 bits wide, set the stage for a lot of other modern processor features, like the no execute bit, for example, and, uh, which is a way for software to tell hardware, hey, you can read data from this region of memory, but uh, don't execute code from it. Like it's a program, it's just data. Those kind of features can go a long way toward building a system that's more secure by giving the system architect clean ways to handle bugs and crashes, programming errors, or even just malicious users trying to do something they shouldn't be able to do. AMD's decision to come up with 64-bit extensions to x86, I mean, that can't have been an easy one. I mean, who would adopt that? I mean, AMD released the 64-bit specs in the year 2000. Intel had already beaten them then to the punch with their own 64-bit processor, the Itanium, which actually had been in development since 1989. So why, why aren't we all rocking Itanium CPUs for 64-bit? Well, for one, the Itanium, it wasn't backward compatible. The brilliance of i386 was that it solved a lot of problems that had cropped up with x86, but was still compatible with 16-bit programs. Even though it was 32-bit, you could still mostly, not entirely, run older, backward, you know, awful 16-bit x86 programs that had already become ubiquitous on desktop computers. So you, you, desktop computers, there's a little bit of a context here. You have to understand that the market 20 years ago and before, the desktop computer was a relatively small piece of the computing business pie. It's business computing. And the desktop computing part of it was just weird. And it was nowhere near as profitable as with large scale computing that you'd find in large businesses. I mean, think large businesses, mainframes, specialty computers, large scale Unix systems. X86 was a toy at that time. You, you weren't going to run big boy Unix on X86 in the 1990s. That's just silly. Intel's Itanium was born out of a partnership with HP. HP and Intel both thought they would come out better, come out ahead together, if they developed a new high-end 64-bit CPU that could also replace the uh, PA RISC CPUs HP was using in their Unix systems. And so by about 1997, 1998, Intel had released the first Itanium CPUs to big HP customers. I mean, 
Intel's thinking was that they, at that time, had no access to that enterprise market. Just x86, and everybody thought of x86 as a souped-up desktop calculator. But Intel really wanted that enterprise server market and those enterprise systems. And HP, for their part of it, they wanted out from under the extreme costs of maintaining high-end CPUs for customers. They saw what was happening with their competitor, DEC, Digital Electronics Corporation, and DEC had prolonged the life of their PDP system a little too long. It dated from the 60s, and they'd failed to replace that correctly, and then they spent a bunch of money, and it didn't work, and what ultimately happened was they basically set large amounts of money on fire for warmth. The DEC Alpha processor was born out of that, and it was actually viable, kind of awesome. It was meant to be for VAX VMS, but it was too little too late. Nothing sucks like a VAX. DEC was so bad off from that transition, I guess we could call it, that eventually Compaq, a desktop PC company, would buy them. Talk about the tail wagging the dog, and then Compaq would drop the development of the DEC Alpha processor altogether. Why? Well, the Itanium, obviously. So in a way, the Itanium is also responsible for the death of the DEC Alpha microprocessor, just as it was responsible for PA risk. And DEC Alpha was just starting to get good when it was dropped. It's, it's, a, it's a crime. It really is. The DEC Alpha. Special place. Eventually, many of these systems would actually run on the Itanium. They'd be ported to the Itanium. You know, Digital's Unix and the VMS and a whole bunch of other things ported to the Itanium. And so you're going to be sitting there thinking, this doesn't make any sense. With all that going on in the 90s and early 2000s, AMD decided to launch their own 64-bit system, and that system became the standard that we all use today? That doesn't make any sense. What the f***? Oh, so you're telling me that AMD's whole Zen microarchitecture is not their first David and Goliath type situation? No. And in fact, when AMD 64 launched, it was, it was literally AMD 64. It wasn't around until 2009 that everybody agreed that we should probably call it x86-64. AMD's 64-bit extensions were about backward compatibility, but also adding good features. AMD also launched a server chip in 2003, April of 2003, 20 years ago, and that was their proof of concept for their x86-64 extensions showing that they worked. And not only was that chip backward compatible with existing 32-bit code, it ran 32-bit code faster than 32-bit CPUs from Intel. Microsoft pretty quickly released a 64-bit version of Windows Server 2003, and there was a real distinct advantage to running 64-bit for your server operating system even if most of your programs were still just 32-bit, even beyond just the ability to have more memory in a server context. I mean, there was a page extension way to have more memory on a 32-bit system, but nobody really wanted to use that, and it wasn't fun. And Intel eventually seeded thousands of Itanium systems into developers' hands, and even that was not enough to outpace the rapid adoption of AMD's 64-bit extensions. I mean, even if you had an Itanium CPU, and even if you had your source code to recompile it your software would still be slower than it was on existing 32-bit CPUs. And AMD just added even more pressure because their 32-bit stuff was even faster than Intel's. Almost always, the code was better than its Itanium counterpart on any 32-bit processor. So that seems like that's not a win for Itanium design philosophy. And a large part of the design philosophy was to try to move the complexity into the code compiler uh, but it made the hardware more complex. The hardware was really too rigid. It's probably the right word versus complexity. And Linux was also starting to take off in a big way during this time. And Linux was sort of taking over the universe for some of these traditional, you know, enterprise Unix systems. And so Intel ceded Itanium to Linux developers. And the Linux people were actually pretty successful. The GNU C compiler people managed to come up with an Itanium code compiler that could produce better code for Itanium than Intel's internal team, which is kind of eye-opening, and uh, in a lot of cases, it was better, but it still wasn't good enough. Those, those x86 processors could still outperform Itanium. You know, here's AMD over here with AMD64. You don't even have to recompile if you don't want to. It's x86 compatible. Want to run VisiCalc for the i386 at eye-watering speeds? Well, AMD Opteron is going to let you do that. And AMD made big news about that, too. It's, it's a lot of fun. AMD actually ended up adding instructions specifically for 64-bit operating systems that are running lots of legacy 32-bit code to really speed things up, like context switches. 
enhanced pointer indirection calculation, all kinds of little incremental quality of life improvements to the overall x86 platform. And they got a lot more life out of it, clearly. I mean, it became the standard, but it wasn't a done deal when AMD launched AMD 64. And x86 does have a lot of flaws. Intel's thinking and in, we need to replace this thing wasn't necessarily wrong. There's a lot of flaws in x86 that are still biting us in the butt today. Things like variable length instructions and so on and so forth. But you know, not long after this Opteron server CPU, AMD launched the FX51, a desktop processor. And that was just a few months away in September. So maybe we'll see AMD do a 20 year cel celebration thing in September. And that was kind of a big bet. I mean, 64 bit extensions on desktop at a time when gigabytes of memory on an ordinary desktop computer was an, an absurdity. I mean, okay, yeah, maybe you might have a server, but a desktop needing support for that. But 64-bit on the desktop was 64-bit ubiquity. And even if everybody is not using it, it's there. That's the ubiquity Intel had been looking for, but they never really got with Itanium and their 64-bit Intel architecture three years earlier. So it might seem like a big risk for AMD to take, but they were kind of cornered into it by Intel. Intel owned the rights to Itanium and IA64, and they seemed to have no interest in licensing it to AMD. Was AMD gonna sit on the sidelines waiting for the end of 32-bit computing? Necessity was the mother of invention, and boy did they invent. At the same time, the growth of the desktop market overall sort of further cemented AMD's place with their plan for 64-bit. It's not a, a direct path to enterprise sales. I mean, nobody thought that desktop computing was gonna take over these enterprise system sales, but you know, Intel's plan was pretty direct. We're gonna use Itanium and they convinced DEC to use it and then Compaq and then Compaq abandoned it. I mean, it, it didn't, didn't work out. But uh, the landscape had kind of changed dramatically in that five year period. I mean, desktop CPU performance had far outpaced CPUs from literally anywhere else. AMD's 64-bit code path became so ubiquitous that Intel had no other choice but to properly license AMD's 64-bit extensions and add AMD's extensions to Intel's Xeon server lineup. I mean, there was some there was some friction around that. I mean, the lawsuits around that weren't really mutually settled until 2009, if that gives you an idea of how much of a dust-up that was. AMD's 64-bit extensions and Intel CPUs? But it was pretty clear early on to everybody, except maybe Intel, that AMD had a winner on their hands with AMD 64. Everybody that used x86 really loved it because that was the path forward that in hindsight made the most sense. And when AMD execs, Jerry Sanders and Hector Ruiz were asked about it in later interviews, <laughs> they were sort of humble about it. And they would just say, well, we just listened to what our customers wanted. You know, we listen to all of our customers, every one of them, but we don't always take everyone's advice. Carrot tops, caramba. Except Carrot Top. Hey, it's your buddy Carrot Top, and I want to wish a happy birthday to AMD 64. It seems like yesterday. Don't hit that button. Hmm. Well, indeed, happy birthday, AMD 64, and congratulations to the AMD teams, past and present, well, the whole gang, on 20 years of 64-bit computing. Yeah, AMD 64 has been a thing longer than i386 was when you had the audacity to launch something so ambitious. Here's to the next 20 years. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level 1 forums. Special thanks once again to Brian Heemskirk, 3D artist extraordinaire, for the, uh, the creations that we use on the Level 1 text channel for pixel artwork and everything else. Oh, and of course, Carrot Top, because of course we have to have that incredibly obscure joke that the groundwork was laid for 20 years ago. Carrot Top actually a computer nerd? Well, we could probably do some stuff if he is. This is the Leslie Nielsen style freeze frame where it's not actually frozen. <laughs>